right, hello. Uh, thanks for joining us at uh, the semester's second and final Cognitive Science in the Arts and Humanities Speaker Series event. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Anishka Kuzmakova, Stockholm University. Uh, she works at the intersections of the humanities and the cognitive and social sciences. Her main area of research is reading as a mental process, embodied experience, and situated practice. Within this area, she's published work on readers' mental imagery, immersion, the experience of audiobooks, and the role of physical environment in reading. Later today, at 4 p.m. right here, uh, we'll be holding a seminar on one of her recently published articles, Does It Matter Where You Read? Situating Narrative in Physical Environment. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you can join us later on. Uh, her talk today is entitled M Reading, Fiction Reading from Mobile Devices. Please welcome Dr. Anishka Kuzmakova. Hi. Um, thanks very much, Dan. Uh, just one last thing I have to ask before I start. Yeah. Uh, everybody seems to be saying mobile devices rather than mobile devices, right? Either one. It's either one's fine. Yeah. I just get a little uh, <laughs> confused about that. Okay, so I'll be I'll be I'll stick to mobile. Okay, it's great to be here. I'm really honored um, to be part of this speaker series, um, and thank you all for coming. Of course, um, a brief. Um, introduction on the background of this talk. It's based on an article project and the two people you're looking at right now are my second and third author. Um, uh, Michael Burke is a professor of rhetoric at University College Roosevelt in the Netherlands um, and his research interests span a broad area from ancient rhetoric to um, neuroaesthetics actually. He's been in the cognitive literary studies uh, for quite some time. Uh, Teresa Schilhardt, my third author, um, is a biologist and philosopher by training, and she works in the education department at Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, so her specialty is learning, formal and informal, and um, among other things, learning with digital devices. And the status of her project at this point is such that we've just submitted a first full version of the article, which means that any feedback you might have can be put to good use in further revision stages, because I'm sure there'll be quite a few. <coughs> okay. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, I will begin by giving a brief introduction on some of the current discourse on digitized reading in general from the viewpoint of user experience. And uh, then I'll say something more about M-reading. I'll offer you a definition that I'll be working with in this talk. Um, then I'll go on to talk about reader-device relations in M-reading specifically from two uh, different perspectives, from the perspective of affectivity and the perspective of situated embodiment. Um, and then I'll talk a bit more about attention and immersion and about how they might be specific in the practice of and reading. And all of what I'll be saying is meant as um, research areas to be further, to be investigated further uh, empirically, um, if possible. Um, so I'll identify some salient, four salient areas uh, where an M reading might be investigated while uh, taking into full account its unique properties, or what I'll be arguing are its unique properties. Uh, why this particular structure? Uh, another purpose of the article and the talk is to provide response um, to leading digitization scholar Anne Mangen uh, of the University of Stavanger in Norway. Uh, so Mangen um, is, her specialty is digital reading from the viewpoint of user experience. Uh, she's also the chair of eRead, uh, which is a network, a research network, uh, comprising members from, I think, over, over 30 countries right now. Uh, eRead standing for the evolution of reading in the age of digitization. And I'm, I'm the scientific secretary in that network and a working group leader, together with Matt Taylor, who was talking to you uh, half a year ago, I believe. Um, and also together with my, uh, one of my co-authors, Teresa Schilhardt, 
uh, and Michael Burke is a, a working group member there as well. Um, so in 2008, uh, Mangin published a pioneering article entitled Hypertext Fiction Reading, Haptics and Immersion. And what was novel about her approach back then and what's still novel about her research today is that she applied an embodied, as an embodied cognition, and experiential perspective on uh, reading technology broadly defined, including print. Okay. Um, and our addition to that is rather modest. Uh, we fully embrace uh, the approach presented and pursued by Mangan, but we want to add a situation constraint on that. Uh, what do I mean by this? Uh, what Mangan does is she researches and she um, writes about the possible implications of given reading technologies in terms of user experience. So for instance, uh, she presents hypotheses and tests hypotheses about, for instance, what the tablet might do to your reading experience overall, um, or the desktop computer. Now, uh, my co-authors and I wish to stress that the affordances of these technologies vary widely depending on where and when you read. Okay? And this is what's meant by the situation constraint. It, of course, varies also with what you read, but this is something that Mangan has been explicit about as well. Um, so just to give you a taste of that er early article of hers, uh, she asks, among other things, uh, will we be reading novels on screen, perhaps on our mobile phones in the future? And eight years later, the answer is affirmative. Um, and she also writes, it seems plausible that the particular sense of being deeply and for an extended period of time phenomenologically immersed that we typically experience when reading a novel is related to and at least partly dependent on the very materiality of the print pages of the book itself. And I have some, or we have some reservations about this, and this is the purpose of the talk. Uh, more specifically, I'll be uh, revisiting two arguments presented by Mangan uh, in 2008 and uh, sort of pursued ever since. And that's the argument that one, digital reading devices call forth an alterity relation on the part of the reader, and two, that reader's capacity for immersion may decrease due to digitization. Um, before I go on to revisit these statements, um, I owe you a definition of M-reading, of course. Um, now, mobile devices afford a vast variety of reading practices. Okay? Um, there are these uh, legible at all, the pictures? You can see them, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you t explain what's in the second one? I can't quite oh, okay. Yeah, uh, there are three people uh, reading from their mobile phones in a subway stop. Uh, so um, there's a huge variety of practices afforded by mobile devices, and there's there's a huge difference between reading, say, in a dedicated sitting, the way the girl to the left does. Uh, in a private environment, she's reading in what seems to be her private bedroom. She's probably reading at bedtime, probably having uh, lots of time to do that, and uh, potentially little distraction coming. Whereas the people on the image to the right, um, they're um, waiting for their subway train. So they're assuming they're reading, assuming they're reading fiction, for instance, um, they're reading with the prospect that their reading will have to stop or might have to stop as soon as the train arrives. Um, and they're reading in a public environment. So, um, as I said, there's a wide spectrum of practices from dedicated settings of the sort you saw in the image to the left to reading on the go of the other sort. Um, and there are also different sorts of mobile devices. Um, there are large devices such as, des uh, such as laptop computers and pocket-sized devices such as mobile phones and everything in between, that is tablets and other stuff. Um, so my main focus will be on reading on the go, which also means 
that I'll focus primarily on reading from mobile phones, okay, because those are best at affording reading on the go. Um, but this requires a further qualification because it seems, and there's some evidence out there, that this sort of reading on the go is more readily adopted by some demographic groups rather than others, uh, namely adult leisure readers uh, who are urban professionals and or parents. Uh, why is that? Uh, because these groups generally are more stretched for their leisure time, uh, so they must be more creative and uh, more ready to compromise on their reading practices, perhaps if they want to maintain the habit in the first place. They might also have generally more funds to purchase ebooks and digital devices uh, in comparison to other students, such as teenagers, for instance, uh, or other groups. Sorry. Um, so how common is M reading on the go of the sort I defined? Um, there's relatively little representative data, but uh, in 2012, the Pew Research Institute um, conducted a representative survey in the US. And uh, the findings suggest that 29% of all those who had purchased an ebook during the previous year had read an ebook uh, on a mobile phone. Okay. Um, and there's again some partial evidence suggesting that mobile phones might be the most rapidly expanding e-reading device worldwide, uh, also thanks to third world literacy campaigns that rely on mobile devices, the mobile phones uh, especially, such as the World Reader Project. Okay, so now let's finally turn to the um, statement, to the first statement that I would like to revisit. Um, that is the statement that digital reading devices call forth an alternative relation on the part of the reader. And I'll revisit that from the viewpoint of affectivity, as I said previously, and the viewpoint of situated embodiment. So what is an alternative relation between a human being and a technological device, anyway? Um, alternative relations are a term invented by Stony Brook's um, famous post-phenomenologist and um, technology philosopher, uh, Don Ivey. And they are one of three possible uh, phenomenological, that is, experienced relations uh, between a user and a technological device. Uh, alternative relations are such relations where in the um, device throughout usage continues to stand sort of in the center of the user's consciousness as a physical object, meaning that the device fails in receding to some sort of transparency in mediating the world, okay? And uh, ID's example of alterity relations, uh, or a device standing in an alterity relation typically, is the computer in gaming, which stands to the user's consciousness as a sort of antagonist in combat. Um, next are embodiment relations, uh, which are the sort of relations that uh, make the device recede into transparency, uh, sort of become invisible in mediating the world out there. And an example of embodiment relations uh, or a device standing typically in, in an embodiment relation are eyeglasses or uh, telescopes. And finally, ID uh, defines what he calls hermeneutic relations, uh, which are uh, re experienced relations of technological devices where, wherein it's neither the physical object as such or nor the uh, world out there that stands in the center of the readers of the person's consciousness, but rather an act of decoding, okay? Um, some sort of reading of the world. Uh, and a typical device standing in a hermeneutic relation is a thermometer, which we must learn to read in order to extract information, um, but also a text. So why are alterity relations bad for reading, according to Mayan? Uh, Mayan says that the combination of the intangibility of the text and the prevalent haptic affordances of the computer 
make our hermeneutic relation and hence phenomenological immersion highly vulnerable to being captured by the haptic affordances of the computer. And what Anna suggests is that the hermeneutic relation has some sort of primacy in reading, of course, and that the alterity relation, if it occurs in reading, sort of operates at the expense of the hermeneutic relation. And I understand the point in general, uh, but my objection to that is that the alterity relation does not always have to be value negative. Um, and smartphones might be a particular case in point here. Uh, they seem to be largely cherished by their owners and users. Um, smartphone users uh, often clutch their phones um, when they're nervous and when they want to calm down. And they even dress them up in fancy sleeves. So they are more beautiful, so they're even more lovable. Um, and this fact that mobile phones in general are cherished by their users uh, was, I believe, first researched by Jane Vincent, a social, sci uh, social scientist, uh, even before the introduction of the smartphone, actually, which is even more sort of uh, addictive and habit forming than its predecessors. Okay. Um, and this fact that people tend to entertain a very strong positive relationships to their uh, mobile devices entails that these devices are regularly used for effective self-regulation or perhaps in more popular terminology what's known as mood management. Um, so, when managing your mood with and through the device, the mobile phone, uh, there are several layers to this process. Okay? Um, you use the content that the device makes accessible to manage your mood. So, you get a kick out of receiving an instant message, a social media posting, uh, reading a piece of news, an ebook, also, or what have you. And this relies heavily on the hermeneutic relation. And if it's an ebook we're talking about, or an artistic text in general, uh, there are again several levels to that in the sense that, say, for instance, the story that you're reading on your phone is tragic, which makes you sad at one level, but uh, at another level it gives you pleasure because the style it's written in is beautiful, oh. has some aesthetic properties. And yet an, an, at another level um, it gives you pleasure from the sheer fact that you're actually able to allocate time to leisure reading in the first place. Okay? Uh, but on top of all that, uh, there is pleasure from the device as a physical object per se. And this is the alterity relation, but value positive. Okay. Um, so this sort of mood management through the device as a physical object, uh, it need not be planned or even conscious. I read recently that smartphone users, uh, on average, check their phone about 150 times a day. And at least some of those checks, <coughs> at least speaking from my own experience, are not planned or even conscious. Uh, they might involve aesthetic pleasure from the design of the object as such. I even find this particular thing pleasurable to interact with. <laughs> uh, and they might in, it, it might involve also pleasure from the feeling that you're navigating a rather complex object skillfully. Okay? Uh, and this positive affect can spill over into the target activity, that is reading, which again results in a sort of consonance rather than dissonance between the hermeneutic and alterity relations uh, in contrast to what Magnan is assuming. Okay, okay so this was the um, alterity relation. Now let's turn to the embodiment relation briefly. Uh, the mobile phone, when used as a reading device, uh, has some unique affordances uh, thanks to combining some technological attributes such as 
availability, facility, and versatility. Now, as for availability, um, M reading uh, requires no planning, uh, which is revolutionary. Uh, uh, the device is worn on the body, which means that you don't have to plan for reading. Uh, you don't have to pack a particular physical object with you where you go. And uh, whenever you wind up in a situation when you don't feel like letting your mind wander freely, uh, you can turn to reading, uh, which entails the broader area of reading environments, uh, generally speaking. Facility, uh, the attribute of facility uh, refers to the fact that the mobile phone can be operated with the fingers of one hand, which again is particularly liberating uh, to those who might be physically disabled in some sense, but also it allows reading in situations where, I don't know, you happen to be carrying something, holding onto your railing, uh, carrying a sleeping infant, a piece of luggage, or undergoing intravenous therapy, uh, which again allows a broad area of situations, uh, more generally. And in situations like these, um, the device becomes gratefully sort of assimilated in what phenomenologists, phenomenologists call the corporeal schema. That is, it becomes an extension proper of the reader's body in a novel way. Sort of, it allows reading in situations that weren't suited for reading previously. Um, here we have an example of a mobile phone being used with the fingers of one hand. Um, finally, versatility. With versatility, I refer to the fact that um, the mobile phone uh, provides access to a potentially unlimited wealth of reading materials, okay. uh, which in turn enables a better matching between the text and the environment. Uh, and this, uh, there's several examples of this practice uh, or phenomenon. There are dedicated apps, um, such as the Palimpsest app, that is currently being developed at the University of Edinburgh. Um, the users of this app, once it's ready, uh, will be uh, offered GPS-specific fiction feed of um, works of literature related to particular sites in Edinburgh. Okay. This is fairly amazing, but also um, relatively rare as an example of uh, matching text to environment. Uh, a more common example might be uh, situated and mostly incidental exposure to online content with local relevance. So say for instance, uh, you are touring the city of Rome, uh, you happen to Google one of the sites uh, that you're visiting, uh, you end up reading a Wikipedia entry, which redirects you to license-free online contents of, say, the Latin classics with local relevance. Now, the local relevance of these classics does something to your uh, reading experience. And finally, uh, there's what we might call self-regulated matching. So um, the uh, the reading app on the phone in the phone. Uh, has a potentially, or it has a very large storage capacity, which enables you to store a number of different ebooks simultaneously and toggle between them, depending on what mood you're in, but also what environment you happen to visit or be in. So, uh, say for instance, there is this work of difficult romantic prose that you gave up in reading, but you might feel inspired to resume reading while, say, walking in the woods because of a particular um, congruence between your environment and this work. So all these examples of matching text to environment boost your mental imagery, hypothetically at least, in aesthetic pleasure and uh, phenomenological immersion rather than um, compromising it. Okay. Um, so, 
that much for the embodiment relation. Now let's turn to um, the second statement or second argument presented by Mangan. That is, that reader's capacity for immersion might decrease due to digitization. This is really um, a more large scale and long term perspective on the previous argument in a sense. And I'll revisit that from the viewpoint of attention and immersion proper. Uh, first of all, what is immersion? There's, say, the consensual definition is that immersion is a sense of deep engagement while reading and it's contingent on sustained attention. Uh, now, why is immersion at risk in digitized reading, according to Mangan? I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, Mangan suggests that the digital device invites you to interact with the display, to change it by clicking and scrolling, and swiping, potentially. That is, it's distractive in itself, which, of course, is bad for reading. And I understand again this point. But um, think of the typical in reading situation as defined previously. Um, that is the sort of reading on the go, and reading on the subway train, or in the supermarket checkout line, as illustrated by the image to the left, or um, say in the waiting room of the doctors, as illustrated by the image to the right. Um, um, what these situations have in common is that they're not particularly pleasurable in themselves. So the supermarket checkout line, um, there's too much boring and irrelevant stuff going on uh, that you might want to screen off. Uh, at the doctors, there might be too little stuff going on, um, people talking in hushed voices, etc. Uh, but still, say, the end reader might not feel like letting her mind wander freely, uh, perhaps because she's nervous about the appointment or whatever. Uh, the bottom line being that of the typical M reading situation might strongly motivate sustained attention on the text in itself because there's little to attend to in the environment that would give you pleasure. Okay. Um, but <coughs> clearly there's more to be said about attention in M reading. So let's flesh out some of the typical distinctions uh, made when researching attention. So in the science of attention, you might research, you might uh, distinguish um, based on the origin of the stimulus attended to, uh, which can be either exogenous, that is originating in the environment, or endogenous, that is originating in one's own mind, so to speak. Uh, one can also distinguish based on the route uh, of attention. Uh, attention can be allocated either bottom up, that is, it can be stimulus driven, such as when you're suddenly distracted by a beep from your phone, or it can be allocated top down, that is, uh, deliberately invested uh, and in full control of the person doing the attending. Um, and finally, um, one can distinguish between stimulus rich and stimulus poor environments. So, stimulus poor environments are those that have lesser potential for bottom up exogenous distractive stimuli, right? Now, um, typically, all the things that I highlighted in yellow on this slide are those assumed good for reading, okay? So, of course, when reading, your attention must be allocated top-down, and preferably, you should focus on um, what's happening in your mind as you're following the text. Uh, there's also an assumption out there that stimulus poor environments are better uh, than stimulus rich environments for reading. So 
uh, libraries were supposed to be quiet, et cetera, right? Uh, so all other things being equal, say the waiting room at the doctors should be more suitable for reading than the supermarket checkout line. But generally speaking, um, I'd like to object to the idea that stimulus-rich environments are bad for reading. I mean, assuming that the typical M reading situation typically is uh, one in a stimulus-rich environment, with the exception of, say, the waiting room at the doctors, uh, consider the following uh, two images. So the image to the left is one of the natural scenery. Okay? It's definitely not a stimulus poor environment, and there is uh, literature, uh, research literature, uh, suggesting that stimulus rich environments of this kind have positive effects on attention and learning and focus. Now, some of this is probably might be innate in some sense, um, inherent to the environment, but to some extent this is also a matter of habit. So, say a person who's never been out of the built environment might find a natural scenery such as this one uh, disturbing rather than soothing, hypothetically. Um, and to the extent that this is also a matter of habit, there are stimulus rich <coughs> built environments that work just fine for reading, such as the library on the image to the right. Okay, it might be quiet, but it's still it still abounds in visual percepts. So stimulus rich environments can support attention for reading. Um, now let's turn to let's return to the typical in reading scenario. So this girl, suppose she's, supposing she's reading fiction, we don't know, uh, is reading on a subway train. Um, and in order to succeed in reading, she needs to um, maintain a number of simultaneous representations in her consciousness. Uh, so she needs to monitor her position in the text. Uh, she's experiencing the text and to some extent perhaps monitoring this experience at a metacognitive level. But she also needs to control her position in the code so as to avoid say, leaning onto a stranger. And she's also monitoring her position on the map of the city, unless she wants to miss the stop. Um, and this is certainly difficult to do, but not impossible. Um, so again, there is literature suggesting that the route and scope of consciousness can be modified through learning, uh, individual or social. Um, <coughs> and a nice, perhaps exotic example of that is uh, the no, no dancing in Japan. This is an example we borrowed from a philosopher, Richard Schusterman. Uh, no performers uh, supposedly also maintain in unusually, uh, an unusual combination of representations or uh, types of consci consciousness in the same time. So they monitor their movement uh, as well as the appearance of their body, so to speak, from the back and the front and the sides. They uh, elicit and sustain an atmosphere in the room as well as monitor the audience, etc. Um, so the bottom line of this subsection would be that M readers can learn to keep track of the environment as needed without excessive attention waste. Um, and noting, of course, that multitasking dispositions vary across individuals, so some M readers might find this easier than others. And finally, there's immersion itself, the term of immersion. Um, ever since the publication of uh, her article in 2008, Mangan has been working on validating her hypotheses um, <coughs> experimentally. And uh, perhaps most importantly, she's teamed up with um, Don Kaiken at the University of Alberta, and together they ran an experiment 
having subjects read um, a story on either an iPad or in a paper booklet. Uh, and they found out that the subject uh, reading in the paper condition uh, found it easier to handle the medium, okay? Or rather, the other way around, the subjects in the tablet condition reported more awkwardness in handling the medium, sort of along the lines of a value negative alterity relation. Uh, Mangan and Kaiken also manipulated um, the subject's genre belief so as so, so that some of the subjects thought they were reading, or were told that they were reading a fictional story, whereas others were, uh, were told that they were reading uh, a non-fiction piece. Uh, now, in the fiction condition, the subjects who were reading from paper uh, reported um, more empathy, uh, sort of in conjunction with immersion, uh, than the subjects in the digital condition. Or I'm saying uh, I'm saying immersion, but it was rather transportation. That is a psychological construct uh, used to measure transportation by self-report. Uh, a construct that was uh, considerably advanced by uh, Stony Brook's own psychologist Richard Garrick. Um, so, on my and Kaiken's account, and most other researchers' account. Uh, Immersion is something that can be measured uh, immediately in conjunction with text processing proper, okay? as was the case in this experiment. Now, I have some concerns about the setup of this experiment, uh, given what I just said on mobile devices. For instance, the tablets to use, used in the experiment were not the people's own devices, but were provided by the experimenters for obvious reasons, uh, um, which of course, meant that they were devoid of personal affect. Okay, um, and the experiment, as such, was sort of non-situated within the people's natural reading practices. But that's something you can't do anything about if you want to run experiments. You need to do it as non-situated as possible. Uh, what I want to focus on, and what remains of this talk, is a theoretical glitch. That is, that this experiment and most others. Uh, fail to account for what might be termed long-term immersion. Okay? Uh, what do I mean by long-term immersion? Um, long-term immersion um, is engagement with fiction beyond instances of reading proper. Okay? In natural reading scenarios, people read stories over extended periods of time, perhaps even months, and the stories often enough continue to exert some effects on those readers, even during the pauses between reading sessions. Okay? Um, so long-term immersion is something that runs in the background of these people's other activities while they're not reading. Um, long-term immersion encompasses a range of phenomena, uh, starting with indistinct moods, say, uh, triggered by a given story, um, by the style in which a story is written, the storyline, the themes, the topics, etc. Uh, it may consist in imagery flashbacks, flashbacks of mental imagery that were initially experienced during reading, and it also can manifest itself as parasocial interaction. Uh, parasocial interaction is a phenomenon uh, most extensively uh, explored in media studies, especially TV research. Uh, and parasocial interaction is reader character engagement beyond instances of viewing or reading proper. Um, so audiences, TV audiences have been found to um, sort of entertain thoughts about their favorite fictional characters from TV. Uh, during their uh, non-viewing time, uh, say, reflecting on these characters' social lives and behavior motives and feelings, etc. And they might even engage with um, fictional characters in imaginary dialogue, something that's actually been documented to, to occur in readers as well, um, by Myla and Kaiki. 
And this uh, her social interaction likely has some, ex um, say, significant social cognitive benefits uh, in the long term. <coughs> Uh, why bring up per social interaction or long term immersion more generally in uh, relation to M reading? Because M reading, reading on the go, uh, allows you to reduce the process between reading sessions to a minimum. Uh, simple as that. That is, it allows you to minimize sort of the risk of forgetting about characters, their social lives, their motives, you know, the plot line and falling out of the general effective set that, it, that allows you to enjoy a given story in the first place. And the parasocial dimension, dimension of uh, long-term immersion specifically is also sort of especially consonant to the deeply social basis of reader device affectivity as uh, defined previously because Jane Vincent, the social scientist, uh, what she found out repeatedly in her studies is that Users primarily cherish their devices as containers and media um, instruments of their interpersonal relationships. Okay. So um, the bottom line of this subsection would be that uh, mobile devices might score lower on immediate immersion, at least in laborat laboratory conditions, but they may be better suited for long-term immersion. And of course, there are further variables playing into that, such as the question of whether you've just begun reading a given story or whether you're already well into it and your level of interest has already been set. Uh, and of course, uh, it depends on what kind of story you're reading, whether it's a page turner or uh, in other uh, type of more difficult fiction, perhaps. Okay, so finally summing up, uh, I've suggested some areas, or my co-authors and I are suggesting some areas for further research. Uh, that is the area of reader device affectivity, uh, situated embodiment, attention training, and long-term immersion. Uh, and our hypotheses are that within reader device affectivity that this might positively affect uh, readers' engagement with text. Uh, within situated embodiment that and reading allows a broad area of reading situations and uh, thus allowing fitting text and situation more closely together. Uh, attention might be trainable uh, through frequent and reading for better engagement with text or for a, for a broader scope of consciousness while reading. And finally, long-term immersion might be afforded more generously uh, by and reading in comparison to any other reading technology in natural reading scenarios. Okay. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge again my co-authors, Professor Michael Burke and Dr. Theresa Shielhub, E-Read, the, the network that provided sort of um, the infrastructure for collaboration in some sense. Um, I also want to acknowledge the authors of the free flicker images that I've been using and uh, crediting on my slides and thank you for your attention. I uh, uh, listed some selected references in case you're interested, I can provide others, of course. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, we can open it up for questions. <laughs> Jump in. Um, thank you. This is so exciting, and I think it, there's tremendous um, implications for the work, which is really exciting. Um, okay. Oh, the, okay. Do you think that the the long term immersion um, is is that a phenomenon that that you see as then requiring or generating or or um, calling forth new forms? In other words. Um, Will we develop a thirst for reading for for a long, for texts that are more supportive of long-term immersion because we have the the, the devices mm -hmm. providing long-term immersion? I'm just mm -hmm. thinking about. Um, so for the, I just keep thinking of this joke from The Big Chill, which is a movie, an American movie from 20 some odd years ago, 
um, where one of the uh, the characters is a is a, a, a reporter for People magazine, and he says, "We're not allowed to write an article that takes longer to read than your average shit." Mm -hmm. And so, and so, I'm just wondering if if you foresee um, that the the device is so valuable that we start looking for for types of for content new forms. for new forms that that satisfy uh -huh. what that is able. Yeah. yeah, from say the opposite end of the spectrum, I've read about um, literary forms becoming uh, more adjusted to reading on the go in the sense that they're becoming shorter, so that uh, I've read about, or I've read some speculations about, for instance, short, short, short fiction becoming more popular because of in reading, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I could definitely imagine uh, the structure of longer works becoming better suited for intermittent reading. Um, sort of this, the way the novel is said to have emerged in the first place as a serial, or at least uh, became established first as a serial form, right? That was then published once the, ser once the series appeared in full, so to speak. So sure, definitely. Um, I can uh, imagine that. I have no proof of that. This is all a matter of what the future will bring. Yes? Um, I currently make all my students buy the books, physical books. Mm -hmm. Should I be letting them read on their phones? Am I a fool for bypassing the potential? Um, um, I wouldn't. Benefits? No. Uh, definitely not. Uh, there is some unique benefit to be drawn from reading in print. And I definitely agree with Mangan on that. So my suggestion was rather that for at least for certain groups and certain type of reading, uh, M reading is the solution to, or and the alternative, where the only other alternative is non-reading, okay? Because uh, there's no time, simply. Um, I would, definitely not argue for abandoning print, um, not at all. I have a question, this is kind of um, uh, general. Uh, there are a few times when you pulled up pictures of people reading on their phones and you're like assuming they're reading mm. fiction. Um, and I thought that was interesting because even as someone who loves reading, uh, and loves reading fiction. I never read fiction on my phone. Mm. Um, and it seems like other things like Facebook or short news articles and updates have been, like filled up more of my time mm -hmm. um, than they would otherwise. Is there like uh, what you're talking about with like long-term immersion, um, the pleasure people get out of reading? Is there a way that we can branch that bridge that disconnect? Mm -hmm. um, between reading fiction and uh, these other things that maybe I wouldn't actually find as much pleasure from, but I can now fill my time with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, there's a bad side to the type of practices that I've been describing. Uh, if, if, if it were possible to compare immersion, say, between reading a Facebook posting, for instance, and fiction <coughs> from your phone, uh, you might find out that there isn't much of a difference. Whereas, again, if it were at all possible to compare, to measure immersion uh, between reading on the go and reading in the lab in a dedicated setting, as I said, there would likely be, you know, a more immediate immersion in that sense. I wonder about long-term immersion in, say, social media. Um, this is one of the purposes of social media, keeping you in touch, right, immersed in the social world that they help access. Um, I'm not sure, though, that you can compare between the two in the sense that they serve different needs.
to a great extent. There are some connections, but generally speaking, there's more dissimilar, dissimilar, dissimilarities than similarities. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yeah? Yeah. So. <coughs> Wait, I just have one more, just a comment on um, how important I think this is. Um, this problem of situated reading seems to be tremendously important that in Gehrig and all the other folks doing this kind of research on immersion. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've, I've been in, in Gehrig's lab dozens of times. It's a tiny little white room mm -hmm. um, that's you know, smaller than the size of this table mm -hmm. where people read, mm -hmm. um, which seems wildly um, off from what actual reading is. And it's normally actually done on a computer, um, more kind of oddly. Um, so yeah, I, just, I think this is super important, interesting work. And, uh, yes. very and I don't mean to undermine uh, the work psychologists do, uh, especially not Richard Gary. No, no, he did uh, awesome, but, but there's is more necessary. to be said on yeah. reading as a situated phenomenon. I yeah. say, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of this is just going off that you kind of wonder then what's the next step because there's like the paradox of both. I don't think we can benefit from that type of research of, with reading, and yet you're relying on it to push against. I guess saying that, you know, this kind of empirical study doesn't work. Um, and like you said at the end, like this is suggestions for future empirical <coughs> study. So it's this weird like back and forth you can imagine yeah. happening yeah. between, you know, a, a psychological methodology saying, oh, it has to be in the lab, and then literary scholars or something yeah. need to pull it out. And it's it, like how much connection can there really be? I mean, there is connection in the sense that Mangan and I frequently talk to each other and, uh, and others uh, with you know similar interests, for instance, my colleagues in the Erie network, and uh, you can hear more and more complaints about reading in the lab being non-situated, and some say fantasies really about setting up experiments in the wild. But from the viewpoint of methodology, this is so complicated, and there are so many problems, um, and. Um, I guess the usual concern is that uh, a psychologist setting up such an experiment would have a hard time having the work published mm -hmm. in a um, typical psychological journal because of the problems, the mess of the data, sort of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, there's coffee and munchkins in the back. Um, okay. Yep, thanks.